Greetings. In today's lecture, I'll summarize the state of the art in algorithms for the integer factorization problem. I'll begin by reminding you of the big O and little o notation. Let f and g be functions from the positive integers to the positive real numbers. I'll say that f is big O of g if there exists a positive constant c and a positive integer n0, such that f of n is at most c times g of n for all n at least n0. In other words, the function values f of n are upper bounded by c times the function values g of n for all sufficiently large n. For example, 3n cubed plus 4n squared plus 79 is big O of n cubed because for large n, the dominant term in this expression is 3n cubed, and we can ignore multiplicative constants in the big O notation. I'll say that f of n is little o of g of n if the limit as n goes to infinity of f of n over g of n equals zero. In other words, the function values f of n are dominated by the function values g of n for all sufficiently large n. For example, 1 over n is little o of 1. Recall that a polynomial time algorithm is an algorithm whose worst case running time function is of the form big O of n to the c, where n is the input size and c is a constant. I'll remind you that the input size is the number of bits it takes to write down the input. An exponential time algorithm is an algorithm whose worst case running time is not bounded by a polynomial in n, where n is the input size. In this course, fully exponential time functions are of the form 2 to the power c times n, where c is a constant and n is the input size. For example, big O of 2 to the power n over 2. Here, the constant c is a half. A sub-exponential time algorithm is an algorithm whose worst case running time function is of the form 2 to the power little o of n, where n is the input size, and not bounded by any polynomial in the input size. For example, the function 2 to the power square root of n is sub-exponential in n. Note that the square root of n is little o of n, and 2 to the power square root of n cannot be upper bounded by any polynomial in n. Very roughly speaking, a polynomial time algorithm should be considered to be efficient. A fully exponential time algorithm should be considered terribly inefficient, while a sub-exponential time algorithm should be considered inefficient, but not terribly so. Consider the trial division algorithm for factoring RSA moduli n. The algorithm is to trial divide n by the prime numbers 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so on, up to the square root of n. If any of these prime factors, let's say L, divides n, then we'll stop and output the factor L of n. The running time of trial division is at most square root of n trial divisions which is big O of square root of n. Question, is trial division a polynomial time algorithm for factoring RSA moduli? The answer is no. The input to the problem is a number n. The input size is log n bits, which I'll call k. Hence, the running time big O of n to the 1 half can be written as big O of 2 to the power k over 2 since n is roughly 2 to the k, and this expression is fully exponential in k. Thus, trial division is a fully exponential time algorithm. This matches our intuition that trial division is a very slow algorithm for large numbers n. I'll next give you an example of a sub-exponential running time that appears in the analysis of integer factoring algorithms. Let A be an algorithm whose inputs are elements of the integers modulo n, or an integer n. 
and so the input size is log n bits. If the expected running time of the algorithm A is of the form ln alpha comma c, defined by this expression, where c is a positive constant and alpha is a constant strictly between 0 and 1, then A is set to be a sub-exponential time algorithm. ln alpha c is big O of e to the power c plus little o of 1 times log base e of n to the power alpha times log base e of log base e of n to the power 1 minus alpha. To make sense of this complicated expression, let's see what happens when alpha equals 0 and when alpha equals 1. First, when alpha equals 0, this term is 1, and this term is log log n. e cancels with one of the logs, and so the expression becomes log n to the power c plus little o 1, and so ln 0 c is polynomial in log n. On the other hand, if alpha equals 1, then this expression is log n, whereas this expression becomes 1. Again, e cancels with log, and so this expression becomes n to the power c plus little o of 1, which is fully exponential in log n. And so, when alpha equals 0, the algorithm A has a polynomial running time, whereas if alpha equals 1, then A is a fully exponential time algorithm. For alpha between 0 and 1, the algorithm A has sub-exponential running time. Note that the closer that alpha is to 0, the closer is A to being a polynomial time, and therefore an efficient algorithm. Note also that the constant alpha is more important than the constant c because alpha appears as a double exponent, whereas c appears as a level 1 exponent. I'll next briefly summarize the state of the art in integer factoring algorithms. We won't have any time for the details in this course. Briefly speaking, there are two kinds of factoring algorithms special purpose and general purpose. Special-purpose factoring algorithms are only efficient if the number n being factored has a special form. For example, n has a prime factor of p, such that p minus 1 has only small prime factors. Or maybe n has a prime factor of p that is relatively small. For example, trial division is only efficient if n has a relatively small prime factor. To maximize resistance to the special purpose factoring attacks, one should select RSA primes P and Q at random. This ensures that the primes P and Q don't have special form with very high probability. Also, P and Q should be selected to be of the same bit length. And this ensures that one prime is not a lot smaller than the other prime. A general purpose factoring algorithm is one whose running time does not depend on any properties of the number being factored. Thus, the running time only depends on the bit length of the number. There have been two major developments in the history of factoring. The first came in 1982 with the discovery of the quadratic sieve factoring algorithm QS. This algorithm has sub exponential running time ln a half comma 1. The next major development came in 1990 with the discovery of the number field sieve factoring algorithm NFS. This algorithm also has sub-exponential running time ln of a third comma 1.923. Note that the important parameter alpha has been reduced from a half to one third. This is at the expense of an increase in the parameter c from 1 to 1.923. It's quite remarkable that no new discoveries have been made in factoring algorithms since the number field sieve was discovered 34 years ago. This long period of time with no improvements to factoring algorithms gives us more confidence that integer factorization 
is indeed a very difficult problem. I'll next give you a brief history of factoring. The first notable record in factoring was set in 1903 when a mathematician by the name of Francis Cole factored the Mersenne number 2 to the power 67 minus 1. This is a 67-bit number. Francis Cole used a naive method for this factorization, and he did the calculations by hand. It took him three years of Sundays. In 2024, I factored the number in 0.02 seconds using the Maple Mathematics software package. This was much faster than the three years of Sundays because I was using a computer and also because Maple uses a much faster algorithm than the one used by Francis Cole. In 1988, the quadratic sieve factoring algorithm was used to factor a 100 decimal digit number, which is also 332 bits in length. This was a distributed computation by hundreds of computers that communicated by email. This was the first example of a large-scale cryptographic computation being done over the internet. In 1994, the quadratic sieve factoring algorithm was used to factor the RSA-129 challenge. This is a 425-bit number. 1,600 computers around the world contributed to this effort, and it took eight months of computing time. This record was notable because the challenge was set by the RSA inventors in 1997, and they expected that the number would not be factored during their lifetime. In 1999, the number field sieve was established as the fastest algorithm for factoring large numbers in practice. The NFS was used to factor a 512-bit RSA number. This was notable because at the time, people were using RSA with 512-bit RSA moduli. The next major advance came in 2009 with the factorization of a 768-bit RSA number using the number field sieve. This was also notable because at the time, some people were using 768-bit RSA moduli in practice. The most recent factoring record was set in 2020 with the factorization of an 829-bit RSA challenge. This was done using the number field sieve and the computation took a total of 2,700 core years. To give you an idea of the size of these numbers, here is the challenge number RSA250 that was factored in 2020. And here are its two prime factors. The next factoring challenge of interest is RSA1024, which is this 309 decimal digit number. Here's a handy table that informs us how to select block ciphers, hash functions, or bit lengths for RSA moduli in order to attain a desired security level. I'll remind you that a cryptographic scheme is set to have a security level of L bits if the fastest known attack on the scheme requires roughly 2 to the L operations. For example, to achieve an 80-bit security level, one can use the skipjack block cipher, or the SHA-1 hash function, or use a 1024-bit RSA modulus. Skipjack is a block cipher designed by the NSA with 80-bit secret keys. The SHA-1 hash function was believed to possess the 80-bit security level. However, after Professor Wang discovered her collision-finding algorithm, SHA-1 now provides only 63 bits of security. The number field sieve for factoring a 1024-bit RSA modulus takes approximately 2 to the 80 operations. As another example, to achieve the 128-bit security level, one can choose AES with a small key length of 128 bits, or use SHA-256, since the VW collision-finding attack takes roughly 2 to the 128 steps. And one can use a 3072-bit RSA modulus, because factoring moduli of this length using the number field sieve 
takes approximately 2 to the 128 operations. In summary, factoring is believed to be a hard problem. However, we have neither proof nor theoretical evidence that factoring is indeed hard. A proof would be a lower bound on any algorithm for factoring. But no such non-trivial lower bound is known. Theoretical evidence might be a statement like, factoring is NP-hard. However, factoring is not known to be NP-hard, nor is it believed to be NP-hard. So the only evidence that we have for factoring being hard is human ignorance. Namely, the last 35 years of research has not resulted in any improvement to the number field sieve factoring algorithm. On the other hand, factoring is known to be easy on a quantum computer. This is due to an algorithm discovered by Peter Shore in 1994. Shore's algorithm is a polynomial time algorithm. We don't know if and when cryptographically relevant quantum computers will be built. In fact, the largest number factored with Shor's algorithm to date is the number 21. 21 is 3 times 7, which shouldn't come as a surprise to you. The big open question is whether cryptographically relevant quantum computers can ever be built. RSA with 512-bit moduli is considered insecure today. A 1024-bit RSA modulus is considered risky today but still deployed in legacy applications. Most applications have moved to 2048-bit and 3072-bit RSA. RSA at these two bit lengths provides 112 and 128 bits of security. Actually, one can even find 512-bit RSA module I use today. In August 2024, it was discovered that a home energy provider in the UK was using 512-bit RSA to sign authentication tokens. The person who made the discovery was able to factor the 512-bit RSA modulus within 24 hours, using $70 in cloud computing costs. With knowledge of the RSA signing key, the person could, in principle, monitor and control the flow of electricity being generated. In the next lecture, we'll present two attacks on basic RSA encryption, a dictionary attack, and a chosen ciphertext attack. These attacks will motivate a strong security definition for public key encryption. We'll then show you RSA, OAEP, a variant of the basic RSA encryption scheme that is believed to meet the strong notion of security. We'll also present the RSA key encapsulation mechanism, RSA-CHEM. Take care! and see you soon.